Hey folks, Darren with Riven Astronomy. Uh, I'd like to say thank you and extend a warm welcome to the four of you who are going to watch this video uh, because today we're talking about a vintage film lens, specifically the Minolta 20mm f2.8 for the alpha mount, the A mount, the original A mount. Uh, for those who are not familiar, Minolta was actually the progenitor of the Alpha line of cameras back in the film days. And uh, this one is branded uh, Maxim. You can find lots of Maxim branded film cameras and film lenses out there. And, you know, back in the day, Minolta was a, a major player. When DSLR age, I guess, uh, came into being, they were purchased by or partnered with or purchased Konica. Uh, I'm not too sure actually what happened there, but Konica Minolta uh, became the brand. And shortly thereafter, the writing, I guess, was kind of on the wall and they decided to get out of the camera, digital camera game entirely. And so what they did is they sold their camera business to Sony. And that's where we get the Sony A-mount, alpha mount, literally just a continuation of Minolta's alpha mount. Nowadays we have alpha E-mount, which I think is confusing and maybe they should have renamed it, rebranded it, but I mean it's working out well for them. I'm not gonna uh, knock it too much, but uh, myself, I do a lot of photography. I do digital photography. I also do film photography and I'm always on the hunt for old lenses, interesting lenses, and I picked this one up in a big kit a little while back and I knew that this is not going to be a great lens for astrophotography or maybe just photography in general, but I wanted to try it anyway because you know what, you got to have some fun. That said, this particular version of the lens has uh, actually some decent build quality. It is plastic on the outside. It's got the um, sort of slanted rubber uh, embellishment around the edges that's common to Minolta lenses of this vintage. The Manual focus ring here is metal, but it's very, very uh, small. That said, we do have a hyperfocal distance indicator here on the lens itself. Some of those niceties of bygone era. Actually, you know, decently large front element. We've got a nice hood, although it is kind of thin plastic. It feels like, you know, it's not the most durable thing in the, in the world. But this lens, I don't know. It gives me joy. What can you say? So let's pop over to Lightroom and see some samples and uh, well, see how bad it is, really. Hey folks, welcome to Lightroom. And let's take a look at this special review of a really old lens, the Minolta 20mm f2.8 for the A-mount. Came out a long time ago. I've got five images here to show you two are untracked and three are tracked. The untracked sample only goes up to f2.8 because let's be honest, there's no point in really going beyond that. I believe the untracked samples are both taken with the 50 megapixel Sony Alpha 1. They're 15 second exposures. The tracked samples are 60 second exposures taken with the Sony A7R Mark V. And the ISO on that is the second base ISO of 320 for the Alpha 1, we have 500 and then 2000, and I'm going to use this to demonstrate to you folks why I use the base ISOs. And uh, yeah, we'll just tuck in here. Here we have our two untracked samples. This one here is taken at ISO 500. This one's taken at ISO 2000. I've actually boosted the exposure values up here in Lightroom and matched them. If you'll notice the histogram here, we're pretty close to being identical. And one of the reasons why I shoot at certain ISO values is because from the perspective of the exposure and noise you get with the ISO, a lot of these Sony cameras actually only have two quote unquote real ISO values. These are analog amplification stages and they're the I guess the entry points for where noise actually uh, can get into the system, or maybe it's more correct to say that 
where different amounts of noise will you know, rear their heads based on the actual ISO values. What happens when you shoot at 2000 is that the camera actually takes the image at ISO 500. But what it does is it just comes up here and it boosts the exposure by itself, essentially, uh, and bakes it into the raw. So you get the same results here. You know this from ISO 500 to ISO 2000. I'll just zoom in here. It's pretty crunchy. This is ISO 2000, ISO 500. Now, mind you, there's a bit of frame rotation, but you know, look at that noise. It's pretty close to being the same. And that just goes to show that ISO 2000, not really that different than 500. But why would you ever shoot 500? Well, now there's not really a good case for this, I'll be honest, in astrophotography, maybe a bit if you're trying to protect star colors or stars, but we do it to protect the highlights to keep them from blowing out. So if you are to essentially shoot at a higher ISO, any clipping that happens in the highlights is going to get baked into the raw file, and there's no going back from that. So you might lose some stars, the brighter stars, to uh, basically pure whiteness. Whereas if you were to rather use a lower ISO, you might be able to preserve some star color, that type of thing, when you tone down the highlights or tone down the whites. So in astrophotography, not the, the you know, best case for it, but certainly in terrestrial photography. That being said, let's take a look at the center of the frame here at ISO 500. And we're not really getting too much star trails, which is consistent with us being at 15 seconds here. 20 millimeters isn't 14 millimeters though, so we are maybe starting to see a little bit of elongation. That being said, we are seeing that we're not really getting necessarily round aberration free stars in the center. It'll need uh, a little bit more sleuthing to figure those out. Let's look in the corners. Oh, definitely, definitely some astigmatism happening. Oh yeah, look at this. That's some classic astigmatism here. In this case, we have tangential astigmatism, which radiates from the uh, center outwards along all the different radii, or if you want to think of it this way, towards the center from the edges. We also have sagittal astigmatism. Sagittal astigmatism rings the center of the image. I mean, for an old lens like this, this is Andromeda Galaxy, by the way. Uh, for an old lens like this, not really surprising. This is really what you would expect. Got some vignetting. You know, it's there for sure. I can't imagine that this particular lens is going to be much better tracked. To be honest, it's probably going to get a little bit worse. So let's go take a look. So here we have, I believe I only tested three apertures, 2.8, 3.2, and 3.5. Here we've got some billionaire space junk going through. That said, let's go take a look at the centers. And oh, so this is an honest-to-goodness example of coma. Here we've got star and then a little fuzzy tail, little fuzzy tail radiating towards the center. Notice in the center of the frame here, we've got round stars, no tail, but if we go in any direction, we start to get those tails. The brighter stars will have them, they'll start to grow, and no matter where we go in the frame, the tails will point, a little fuzziness will point towards the center of the frame. This lets us know that this is internal chromatic aberration. Oh yeah, look at that. It is the uh, comet tail is pointed towards the center of the frame. Here, you got a mix of things happening. It's probably still that coma, but this is that sagittal and tangential astigmatism, making all kinds of neat shapes. This is pretty much halfway to the to the short edge from the center, so that astigmatism is coming pretty far in. Yeah, not even on the long edge here are we. Halfway to the long edge, we still got some coming in. Again, what do you want from a vintage film lens, right? But that's the fun of doing this. So, so here we are, close to the middle. F two point eight, three point two, three point five. You can see that as we stop down, that coma corrects itself a little bit. Let's go look in the. Well, let's go mid frame here. Yeah, we've got a little bit of coma maybe, but we're definitely starting to get that astigmatism. That was 3.5, 3.2, hmm, there, there it is. <laughs> it's alive and kicking, and 2.8, lots of coma. Not surprised. I guess we can go to, this is, this is probably the busiest corner. Let's go take a look. 
Um, yeah, I, I'm not surprised. What do you want from a vintage lens? So f2.8, lots of uh, astigmatism. F2, 3.2, still lots of astigmatism. And f3.5, astigmatism forever. Long live astigmatism. Again, not surprised. But that, I think, is kind of a fun look at an oldie, not necessarily a terrible lens, um, you know, depending on what you want to use it for. Here, this is, I feel, this is around where the true center of the lens is. You'll see here we're, maybe, maybe we're in the middle-ish enough, but yeah, that coma starts early, but right here in the, in the true middle, we've got a, a, a couple round stars, so that's pretty good. All right, so how does this lens do as far as distortions? And uh, here the image is already boosted by about two and a half EV. So we're going to enable profile corrections. And well, so it's really even the exposure out. Uh, we've, uh, if you pay attention here on the preview navigator, we've resolved a ton of the vignetting, not 100% of it. There's still you know a little bit in the corners, but not too bad. And yeah, as far as the center, like it really has flattened out. So we've got some obvious barrel distortion here. And when we enable the corrections, it flattens that. It stretches the edges out a little bit because if you imagine it's trying to correct for, I'm gonna imagine there's a, a, a sort of sort of radius or range of uh, radii out from the center and it's gonna be more or less flat there see if there's yeah if you watch right up here at the top you'll notice this star right near the the edge or maybe uh, take a look here right at the bottom when we flip the corrections on and off those stars are not moving they're not disappearing so you can imagine the center portion here is getting flattened away from us and the edges are getting pulled towards us if i can draw your attention over here to the lens profile we can see that sony this is a Minolta lens, but Minolta was purchased by Sony, and Sony continued to produce a lot of these same lenses that Minolta had created, basically, had uh, manufactured and, and done all that R&D on under the Sony banner as part of the continuation of the A-mount. And they released you know, a bunch of DSLRs back in the day, both crop and eventually full-frame DSLRs, that used the A-mount. So if we click here on Sony, you'll see there's Sony, Sony E, and Sony FE. So Sony E is E-mount. Sony FE is full frame E-mount because a lot of people forget when Sony first got into mirrorless, they didn't do it with the A7 series. They did it with the Nex series. So you had an APS-C mount, and that APS-C mount was the E-mount. The FE is the full frame E-mount. And just here, Sony is the, how should we say, Minolta A-mount lenses, for lack of a better word. And you can find some other ones like the Fisheye 16 millimeter. I hope to get my hands on one of these. They're pretty cute. And, you know, there's a lot of other lenses here, but you get the idea. It's cool that we still actually have access to a profile correction for this. Now, is anyone gonna notice if you have a, a photo like this, you can still correct the vignetting yourself at least you can try um no probably on a single frame no one's going to notice where distortions and you know flattening transformations like this come in handy is when you're doing time lapses when you're stacking if things shift in the frame at all the geometry need to match up so you will be experiencing some benefit from doing profile corrections like this that being said, I don't know that you're going to stack, uh, you know, this flock of seagulls necessarily, but I have a soft spot for these old lenses. What can I say? So overall, the default profile here ooh, does a decent job of flattening things out and a decent job of correcting the vignetting. We can come in here and we can just touch it up in manual tab and get some cleaner corners here, losing some of that darkness. And this is the type of thing where, you know what, you might have to go, okay, my copy of this lens requires a little bit of extra vignetting correction and maybe a change in the midpoint. 
in addition to the profile. Profiles are profiled off, you know, either one copy or a handful of copies. And people don't always appreciate that there's a lot of variability from copy to copy. So by keeping track of this type of stuff, you can just sync it across a whole range of images, or you, know, you can write it down or reference back to it uh, from images you've already processed. And that can help you make sure that you don't have to you know, tweak it by feel every time. You can just find what is good, remember it, write it down, etc. You're probably an adult. I'll leave it to you. All right, folks. Well, I hope you enjoyed this in-depth look at a really out-of-date lens. These samples will be available for download. Check the description. And this is maybe more true of this than any other review, but the samples are provided for your personal use, for assessing the lens, for your curiosity. By all means, pixel peep, process them if you want, but please don't distribute them. Please don't post them online. Please don't misrepresent them as your own, et cetera, et cetera. Well, you know what? Honestly, not quite as bad as I expected from a, you know, 20 mil lens from the eighties. Um, yeah. Am I going to use this? You know what? I might, I've got some, uh, aspirations of doing film, uh, photography, film astrophotography specifically and tracked might be able to get a, a decent Milky way out of this. I'm not really sure. Um, if anyone is familiar with film, uh, you know, high ISO films, are uh, something that you would have to use in this application and the way that film works it's different than digital so you actually have to expose for much longer than you would i'm talking you know what might be a 30 second exposure on a digital camera might need to be 45 minutes long on the appropriate film but with a bright f2.8 aperture might be worth a try anyway hope you found this curiosity interesting and of course, I'm going to pepper some of these in every once in a while, but, um, you know, tune in next time because we're probably going to talk about something a little bit newer and hopefully it'll be something that's interesting to you. Take care.